I have the privilege this morning of introducing uh, our speaker, uh, Willamette Professor Jim Friedrich. Uh, Jim earned his bachelor's degree at Oberlin College and his PhD in social psychology from the University of Michigan. He has been a faculty member in the psychology department at Willamette for 27 years, uh, during which time he's pretty much done it all. He's been honored for his uh, teaching, his scholarship, and his service. And by the way, those are the three criteria that are used by Willamette to evaluate faculty. I want to mention two of his profes professional accomplishments that I think are especially noteworthy. First, he is the, as one of my econ colleagues uh, 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 said, he is the father of quad. Now, quad is not a small boy. Uh, quad stands for quantitative understanding, analysis, and design. And it's a drop-in center uh, staffed by faculty. In fact, Jim has, has been the uh, co-director uh, of that center since its inception, and by students who offer other students uh, assistance in number crunching uh, in support of their research projects. Needless to say, this has led to a significant improvement in the quality of undergraduate scholarship. A second accomplishment of Jim's that I think is truly noteworthy, he doesn't know I'm gonna say this, but he has co-authored with students more than a dozen peer-reviewed journal articles. I mean, this is, this is beyond my my imagination. Uh, he has also co-authored with students two, more than two dozen conference papers. Now to say that this gives his students a leg up is probably an understatement. It probably gives them two legs up as they apply for uh, positions in the, in the world of work and especially in the, in the academic uh, world for graduate uh, study. I think it's fitting this morning that Jim is going to be talking about research that he is undertaking with undergraduates, uh, since that's been such an important part of his uh, tenure at Willamette. Maybe as further evidence of his dedication to students, he might be leaving a little bit early today to, in order to not be late for a class across the street at Willamette. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Jim Friedrich. Uh, thanks for the invitation here. I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I see some familiar faces. Uh, I have been around this campus for quite some time and some other campuses at another decade before I came here. Um, uh, but the research that I'm talking about today is in a general field that's really animated me since I was an undergraduate. Uh, sometimes it's hard putting a finger on exactly what it is that interests you, you sort of have a general sense of it, but uh, through my teaching and my experience with colleagues here and a lot of my work with students, uh, I want to share with you today uh, one particular area that I have started to focus on, and that is on removing bias from our judgments. Uh, in the first half, I'm going to be talking about some uh, sort of conceptual and you know, perhaps theoretical issues that sort of sets up the problem and then after the break I thought I would share uh, some of the data that we've been obtaining uh, through a number of projects that my students and I've been working on over the last uh, uh, several years. Uh, to make those a little bit more meaningful they involve a couple of fairly simple uh, questionnaire tasks and so uh, rather than waiting until I've already primed you with all sorts of information that might contaminate your, your judgment here, um, I, have, uh, I think I brought about 60. I think I underprinted. Um, I'm not used to such high attendance. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, if, if you're here as a couple and you want to share a copy, there's, it's just a single sheet of paper. There's one task on each side, and I'd like to spend just a few minutes uh, having you complete that. You're not turning it in. Uh, you're not going to be uh, graded on it or anything like that. 
Uh, but rather than try and put a bunch of small print on the screen to explain what these tasks are, I thought it might be helpful if you had actually had a chance to uh, look at them. So it doesn't matter what order you do them, and we'll uh, try to circulate these. Okay, you can set these aside for the moment. I will tell you one thing. There are two different versions of these forms that went out. Uh, they were in a randomized order, but half of you on both tasks were basically asked to answer questions about yourself or make decisions about information that you would want for yourself if you were making a decision. The other half of you now realize you were asked to make a judgment about other people their likelihood of making a certain kind of judgment, or you were making decisions about what kind of information to get for someone else to use. And this self versus other distinction is going to be very central to what we talk about today. Uh, so the title of the talk is Removing Bias from Our Judgments, Did Ulysses Have It Right? It turns out it's going to take a little while to get to the Ulysses connection, but we will get there. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is talk about the notion of bias. Right now, the, the class that I have to hurry off to at the end of this talk is a senior seminar called The Many Meanings of Bias. It's a term that gets thrown around a lot. Right? If you disagree with me, does that mean you're biased? If we have different preferences, if you like trucks and I like Priuses, does that mean we are biased? or do we simply have different preferences? So one of the things I'd like to do is sort of sharpen what we mean by the notion of bias, because it's not always tied to animus or ill will. Um, but when psychologists and judgment and decision-making researchers talk about bias, they're talking about errors. And to talk about something being, being an error, you have to have some standard of correctness. Now, there can be multiple standards of correctness. If you're thinking about making a risky decision and changing irrelevant parts of the problem description, you shouldn't change your judgment, right? So consistency there would be the standard of correctness. If your judgment is changed by irrelevant information, then we would say there's an inconsistency that irrelevant information has introduced some kind of bias. But there's always some implicit standard of correctness, and I put it in scare quotes because we may differ in terms of what we think is the appropriate standard of correctness. Now, errors can be random. If you think of an analogy of an archer shooting at a target, the bullseye is that standard of correctness, and errors are departures from the bullseye. And your errors can be all over the place, high, low, left, right, close, way off, but those wouldn't represent a bias, right? A bias refers to some kind of systematic deviation from a standard. So for example, if I'm evaluating somebody's qualifications as a potential student at Willamette, and for some reason I am systematically underestimating their potential, right? Because maybe I'm looking at a student who didn't have access to the same opportunities, but I'm holding the same standards. Maybe I am systematically underestimating a potential student's uh, uh, potential. So it's systematic deviation from that standard. Now I would add that it's systematic deviation of some magnitude. Being off by a tiny bit may not matter much. Being off by a lot can make a huge difference. We are frequently making mistakes and engaging in fairly small or subtle biases. But when those biases grow in a way that says we're only hiring men in an occupation, a systematic departure from a standard of hire who is qualified, those become either personal problems for the decision maker, personal problems for the people who are, the, are subject to those decisions, and problems for organizations that have to make decisions. So paying attention to the magnitude is also important. This gets into the heart of what we're talking about. Sometimes they are occurring consciously. In other words, I might have some awareness that I am being pulled in a particular direction. So for example, if I am being asked to evaluate the work performance of a colleague in my department, which we do routinely, and I happen to like that colleague a lot, 
and I'm drafting that letter of evaluation and trying to provide an objective evaluation, but I may be actually aware that wanting to give the benefit of the doubt is affecting that letter. Or when I'm writing a letter for a student for a graduate school application, and I'm concerned like, well, if everybody else is inflating their letter, if I don't inflate my letter for my student, then I put them at a disadvantage. So I may be consciously aware that I'm sort of distorting from some standard. But research in psychology shows that even more often our biases occur unconsciously, outside our awareness. They are subtle influences that we simply don't detect. And so we'll be talking about that in general because we're particularly interested in those kinds of unconscious biases. So a term that sort of made it into the popular lexicon is the term implicit bias. That even when we don't, for example, hold explicit racial biases, we might have these subtle, non-conscious biases that are influencing the way we perceive others, perceive job candidates, and the like. And that these may actually have behavioral consequences that are significant. The problem is if these biases are unconscious, what do we do about them? So a number of years ago, Wilson and Brack, I try not to put too many names and papers in here. I'm not great with names, so they're in smaller font. But Wilson and Brack, back in 1984, published, uh, I think, a really important paper where they introduced a framework that they call mental contamination as a way of thinking about particular kinds of bias. So first off, they say mental contamination, if you think of the analogy of food being contaminated, nobody wants contamination. Sometimes I want to be biased. Sometimes I want to give that student that little extra boost in that letter of recommendation. But when we think of contamination, we think of unwanted influences on our judgments. So here's their definition. I've tried not to go too text heavy here, but they say the process whereby a person has an unwanted judgment emotion or behavior because of mental processing that is unconscious or uncontrollable. That's the domain that they're focused on. And just to reiterate, unwanted simply means the person would prefer not to be influenced in that way. So if I'm evaluating job applicants, uh, do I want a photo of that job applicant? Well, there could be jobs for which a photo is relevant, if I'm hiring models, for example. On the other hand, for most contexts, we would say the photograph is irrelevant. It gives us all kinds of information that I would prefer not influence my judgment. They might give me information about the candidate's age or weight or physical appearance, a variety of things that I might personally believe should not influence my judgment. I don't want it to. But if I see that photo, and you'll notice on one of the tasks I gave you, it asks you whether or not you would like to see the photo of the scholarship applicant, there is a potential for introducing that kind of information. So let me just give you a, a few more examples. Uh, grades and other rating performances. I do blind grading as often as possible. So a multiple choice exam doesn't matter, but an essay exam where there's subjectivity to my answers, I have students enter an anonymous code and they don't get their name on it until after I've graded it and handed it back. Now as we'll come back to later on, I, I've been doing this for a long time and now almost all of my colleagues in the psychology department do it. They seem to find it reasonable. I had talked to colleagues in other departments when I first shared this and they, they said, well, do you have a problem with bias? I, I don't blind grade. I, I don't need to. Are you having a problem with being fair? <laughs> now, I, I think that answer was given in good faith, right? The person truly believed they weren't biased. They had good intentions. They did not want to be influenced. The question is, were their judgments in grading contaminated by the knowledge of who they were grading? Now, blind grading doesn't guarantee error-free, but it tries to make those errors random. 
right? It tries to make sure that I don't give systematic errors in one direction, so I get an ambiguous answer and I, I, I give the benefit of the doubt to the student I've seen there every day, but for the same answer from a student who has irregular attendance, I mark it down. Right? If I believe the answer should stand on its own, knowing their identity and their attendance should be irrelevant. The same is true in many other kinds of job performance. Let's think about courtroom. I've served on a grand jury and uh, one or two juries in my time. Uh, one of the things that's usually excluded is information on the defendant's prior record or hearsay evidence. Now it's interesting how that's accomplished. So defendant's prior record, hearsay evidence are not supposed to be introduced, but occasionally they are. We've all watched a lot of TV. What do we do when something spills out about the defendant's prior record or hearsay evidence is introduced? Somebody objects, right? And then the judge, if they uh, support that view, say, you know, the, the jury will disregard that information. <laughs> Mental control. Just pretend you never heard it. Okay? But we do institutionalize some restrictions in order to try and avoid contamination. We've already talked about examples of a job applicant's attractiveness, gender, race. Now, remember, we're talking about unwanted influence. If I'm sexist or racist and I purposely want to exclude members of a group, that wouldn't fall under this umbrella of contamination. That would still be a form of bias, but that would be an intentional bias rather than uh, an unwanted contamination. So let's think about structured versus unstructured interviews. Turns out uh, I, I teach some in the area of industrial organizational psychology and employee selection, uh, student selection and admissions. Um, a structured interview is where you follow a very specific set of questions. No matter what the person says in response, you're going through the same set of questions. The more commonly used technique uh, is the unstructured interview, where you maybe start with a couple questions and then you just see where the conversation goes. Of course, if I happen to find out that uh, the person I'm interviewing was a wrestler, uh, which I was for many years and coached, and the conversation goes in a certain direction because now I feel like I have this connection with the person, the conversation's very easy, uh, I get a very different experience in that interview. On the other hand, in an unstructured interview, if I find out that the person's into stamp collecting and I'm not into stamp collecting and think that's a peculiar hobby, uh, actually, I'm an outdoor gear collector, so I do understand the collector motive. Uh, but the idea here is that by doing an unstructured interview, I expose myself to a systematic distortion in the collection of information that might influence my judgment. Now, speaking of distortions in selected information, let's think of our news viewing habits. Uh, we tend to have favorite channels and I for a long time was watching two very opposing channels because I felt I needed to get all that information but over time one channel was annoying me more and more uh, <laughs> one probably annoys you more and it's not the same one for all of you right but the idea is that I start making a decision to exclude certain sources of information but I maybe think that's not really going to contaminate my judgment because I can be objective with this. I don't need to expose myself to those other competing viewpoints. So let's also think in terms of uh, medical diagnoses. Uh, we have concerns, uh, for example, uh, there's some research suggesting that uh, their algorithms lead to uh, differences in the kind of health care interventions that people get based on their uh, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic class. Now, that doesn't mean that physicians are sitting around consciously trying to weigh this information in their judgments, but there seem to be some cases in which those sorts of factors end up influencing people in subtle and unwanted ways. Even thinking about treatment decisions, one kind of controversy is whether uh, pharmaceutical representatives should be able to go into doctor's offices and give them all sorts of free stuff. I don't know if we have any physicians in here, so I, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I do know that the pharmaceutical industry markets to people uh, and will sponsor uh, uh, information sessions that uh, have some nice benefits associated with them. And uh, the question is, 
is that in some subtle way, unintended way, influencing a physician's decisions about what kind of medicine to recommend? Now, it could be that the person says, sure, I'm going to, because I get a kickback here. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the person who wants to be unbiased and impartial and, if, and uh, effective in their decisions, but they're exposed to something that might contaminate their judgment. So think about what the steps would be for mental correction. So I, I've broken up a sort of a flow chart to enlarge the size, and I'll, I'll sort of walk us through it. Uh, the flow chart would have been uh, pretty small in print. But Wilson and Breck lay out this logic. They say, if we have unwanted mental processing being triggered, right, I've been exposed to the pharmaceutical reps, goodies, and some processing is happening about how I'm thinking about this product. Right? Or I've been exposed to the identity of the student whose exam I'm grading and it's starting to trigger some unwanted mental activity. That doesn't mean that it's conscious, but something's going on as a result of that exposure. Then the first step to correcting for any bias is I have to be aware of the unwanted processing. That, as we've learned in research, is a high hurdle. A lot of things influence us that we are simply not aware of. And if we're not aware of the processing, then off to the left we go. We're out of the loop. We're going to have a contaminated judgment. These things are influencing us, and we didn't even know it. It's going to contaminate our judgment. However, if the answer to that question is yes, we go to the right. There's another question. If I'm aware of the unwanted processing, the next question is, am I motivated to correct for it? If I say, well, I, mean, I am kind of aware that I'm giving this person the benefit of the doubt, but I don't really want to adjust for that, or I, I could correct for it, I don't want to be biased in grading, but it's so much extra work to do blind grading because I have to tell them not to put their name on it, then I have to hand it back by ID, then I have to have them tear off their ID, and it, there's a lot of extra steps there. So there are a variety of reasons why I might be aware of the underwanted processing, but lack the motivation to correct for it. If the answer to that question is no, I'm back over into contamination land. Right. I'm aware, but I don't care enough. I'm going to have contaminated judgment. But let's say you pass that hurdle. You are motivated to correct the bias. You're aware of, the, you're aware of it and motivated to correct for us. Then you have to be aware of the direction and the magnitude of the bias. So I did one study, it's not going to be on our list today, where we gave people uh, hearsay evidence or not in a trial uh, with judges' uh, recommendation that that testimony be ignored. And then we asked people to indicate how much they think that influenced their judgment, how much they think that hearsay influenced other people's judgments, even though they've been told to disregard it. And they gave an estimate. They thought it influenced their judgment. They thought it influenced other people's judgments even more, which we'll get to. <laughs> not, me a little, you a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm not perfect, but you're way off. Uh, but when we actually compared it to the control group who didn't get the hearsay evidence in this particular study, it did not have an impact. There were no differences between the verdicts rendered and the degree of confidence between the group that was exposed to hearsay evidence with instructions to disregard and the group that was not exposed to the hearsay evidence. So when I say be aware of direction and magnitude of bias, it can also apply to the fact that sometimes we think bias has happened and it didn't. We can sometimes even be wrong about the direction in which we are being influenced. We're aware of some unwanted mental processing, we're motivated to correct for the bias, but we don't have a good enough grasp of what's going on in that unwanted mental processing to know which direction it's moving us or how big that bias is. Now, there's sort of two ways in which we be can become aware of that direction or have a hunch about that direction. One is through introspective analysis. We do this inward searching. Problem is, is if a lot of these things are occurring outside of conscious awareness, that inward searching is not going to be very effective. The other possibility is that we may have plausible theories of bias. 
In other words, I may not feel myself being moved by the identity of the person I'm grading. I may not feel myself or introspectively sense myself being moved by those pharmaceutical goodies. But I have a reasonable theory that says these things influence people. And they influence them to some concerning degree. So I might still answer yes to that question. If I answer no, it's back to contamination. If I don't know the direction or magnitude of bias, I can't do anything about it. But if I do answer yes to that question, then there's another one. Am I able to adjust my response? Do I have the kind of mental control necessary to alter the way that I'm responding and do it in a properly calibrated way? Sometimes our gut level feelings are very difficult to move around. They're strongly sensed. Uh, it can be very difficult to actually exert the kind of mental control to adjust our judgments. Now, if we are able to adjust the response and control it, we may get some partial correction. This is imprecise work that we're doing. But if we really do a good job, we can get to that full successful correction. But what I want to highlight, I'm going to zip back a couple slides, is how many things you have to be able to say yes to before you can debias your judgment. You have to have unwanted mental processing. You have to be aware of the unwanted processing. You have to be motivated to correct the bias. Then you have to be aware of the direction and magnitude of the bias. And then you have to be able to adjust through your response or control it. If you can do all of those things, then you have a shot at being able to debias your judgment, which presumably is your goal if you want to avoid mental contamination. So I, I sometimes analogize that. I, I, in my social psychology, I talk to my students. I say, what do you think the probability is you're going to find the perfect person? I ask them, what are all the perfect attributes of your perfect person uh, for a partner in life? And they'll make out those attributes. And then we'll sort of draw this Venn diagram on the board that says, OK, of your sexual preference, OK, then you narrow it down uh, of, you know, available. <laughs> <laughs> You meet them. So preference, available, meet them. They like you. <laughs> that set, you keep adding these requirements, and then we get into all the list of the things that they must have from intelligence to humor to uh, you know, all these other factors, and that set gets smaller and smaller. It's really hard to get to the end with a yes to all of those questions. And my students say, why do you depress us? <laughs> and I just say, this isn't meant to depress you. It's just to encourage you to be flexible, right? <laughs> um, to, to be open. Uh, but here is a case where it's hard to get all those yeses and get to this. And so Wilson and Breck said, it's actually very rare that we can do this. And they offer a, a lot of research at each step along the way. So what do they suggest as an alternative? They say, if you don't want to be contaminated in your judgment, don't expose yourself to the contamination. If you don't expose yourself to that information, then it cannot trigger the unwanted mental processing that has this cascading effect. The most effect solu effective solution is, for example, to bl grade blindly rather than to grade with knowledge of who my students are and then have to say, OK, am I aware of this unwanted mental processing? Do I want to correct for it? How far am I biasing? Maybe I was not giving the benefit of the doubt, but I thought I was, so I adjusted the wrong direction. You can see how many ways it can go wrong. They say exposure control is the key. Now this leads to some practical, practical and ethical consideration. And here's where we get into this notion of exposure control and binding strategies. So uh, Thinking about the story of uh, Ulysses and the sirens, uh, Ulysses wants to hear the siren song, but he's been warned that listening to the siren songs will lead to his demise. Um, uh, as, the, as the text says, 
if anyone unwarily draws in too close and hears the singing of the sirens, his wife and children will never welcome him home again, for they sit in a green field and warble him to death with the sweetness of their song. Okay, I'll leave out the part about rotting bones and other stuff. Okay. But then he's given a suggestion. He says, therefore, pass the sirens by. Stop your men's ears with wax that none of them may hear. So he's on this boat. He wants to get close to the island to hear the sirens. So they're just as vulnerable. So stuff their ears with beeswax so that they can row and not be exposed to this unwanted processing of the siren song that will lead them to their doom. But of course, Ulysses wants to hear. <laughs> I, I want to hear that song. I've heard it's wonderful, but I don't want to die. So I says, but if you like, you can listen yourself, for you may get the men to bind you as you stand upright on a cross piece halfway up the mass. <laughs> in other words, we're going to put wax in your ears and you're going to roll like crazy but you're gonna tie me to the mast. You're not gonna put wax in my ears, but you're gonna in some other way bind me to prevent me from acting on this potential contamination. So binding, stand upright on a cross piece halfway up the mast, and they must lash the ropes into the mast itself that you may have the pleasure of listening. If you beg and pray the men to unloose you, then they must bind you faster. In other words, the men have an instruction, no matter how much I beg and plead, because the siren's going to drive me crazy. Sorry. <laughs> Used to smaller classrooms where I can move a little. Uh, so, so when we think of Ulysses' dilemma, he wants to be exposed, but he doesn't want to pay the consequences of the contamination, so he binds himself. So I would, for example, say that the decisions we make in a courtroom that says we will not allow information on a person's prior criminal conviction or hearsay evidence is a form of binding, right? We make these decisions, we establish these rules, we don't leave it up to the individual judge or the juror to say whether, ah, this week I think I'll go with prior record, uh, uh, or this week I think I'll let myself handle hearsay evidence, right? We make these binding rules that limit our exposure, that puts the wax in our ears in a sense. Uh, so this is the connection to Ulysses because we're interested in whether or not people do this. So the question that often comes up is, do we have an ethical obligation to act so as to prevent bias and contamination in our judgments? Because often those contaminations have consequences for others. The students we admit, the people we hire, the people we diagnose and treat medically. And Holroyd and her colleagues have talked about the fact that there are sort of three prerequisites. One is that we have to be aware of bias or reasonable possibility. So now we're back here, well, if I'm not aware of it, can I really be responsible for it? Well, if I have good reason to think I might be vulnerable, a reasonable possibility, then she would argue we do have an obligation to act, to take precautions. So even though I might not be aware of what's happening with my student grading, if I'm aware of that reasonable possibility, perhaps I should act on it. I have to have some way of correcting for it or preventing for it. If there's nothing I can do about it, it's hard to hold me responsible. However, in this case, I can set up rules of evidence and what can be distributed in court, or I can make a decision to do blind grading, or I can decline uh, promotional materials from pharmaceutical representatives. And the third part is that the consequences for others have to be a sufficient magnitude to justify the effort, right? Minor biases, it can be a lot of work for little gain or benefit, but if we are recognizing significant consequences for others, they don't get hired, they don't get the job, they don't get admitted to college, they don't get the right treatments medically, those are significant consequences. And together, she argues, these three things do create an obligation. So even if we are not aware of these contaminations, if we have reason to suspect it, there are preventative measures, binding measures we can take, and there's enough at stake, 
she would argue that we do incur some ethical obligation here. Now, as a scientist, uh, I try and draw sharp distinctions between what I can claim scientifically and what kind of moral prescriptions I can make. So I wanted to share the ethical dimension of this without saying that I think this is the final word on the, on the ethical perspective. Now, one of the things that I wanted to get into here, and we're going to be sharing some data in the later half, is this idea of binding as required versus discretionary. So for example, we're often willing to impose binding on others. We set rules about what information people are allowed to see. Uh, we might uh, specify again in the courtroom model what the rules of evidence could be. Sometimes we just recommend binding rules. So as a researcher in psychology, we use similar practices to medical research. We talk about double-blind experiments. The idea of a double-blind experiment is that the experimenter doesn't know what level of treatment the person has received, and the patient doesn't know, for example, or the respondent doesn't know what level they've received. My father uh, had gotten uh, early Alzheimer's, and he participated in an experimental uh, medication treatment. And he had to sign off to a procedure that says, we've got a treatment and we've got a placebo pill. Uh, to participate in this study, the person who gives you this medication is not going to know whether you got the real pill or the fake one. You are not going to know whether you got the real pill or the fake one. And the people who are collecting information from you, measuring your memory, asking how you're doing, they too are not going to get information. This would essentially be a triple blind study. Do you have to do a study that way? You could do a study where the researcher knows who's in the treatment group and the control group. But we have good reason to believe that those bits of information subtly influence the way people behave. When you think about uh, therapists. It's kind of interesting. I saw a study a long time ago that for some reason, uh, Freudian therapists seem to have patients that report Freudian problems. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapists tend to have uh, patients who report cognitive behavioral problems. Uh, we sort of perhaps see what our theoretical lens leads us to expect. So if I expect participants to behave in a certain way, and they do, if I haven't blinded myself as an experimenter, then my judgment might be contaminated. My results might be contaminated. So we recommend binding rules uh, as just an example in research. Or I recommend blind grading when possible. Uh, my colleagues, again, in the department typically do it because as researchers, as psychologists, they say, yeah, this is just like blinding the experimenter. Uh, not everybody that I talk to on campus uh, would agree that that's necessary. And a lot of them legitimately say, look, you know, I've been working with students on term papers. I can't blind myself to that because we've been talking about their paper project all term. Right? There are certain things that that, that kind of blinding doesn't work for. Now, that gets at this idea of discretionary. But a lot of my own day-to-day -day decisions, I have to decide for myself. I voluntarily impose some kind of exposure rule or binding process on myself. So when will I do that? Okay, I'm not biased, right? So the idea here is that we run into a problem because so much of correcting for contamination, if we are going to use this binding or exposure control approach, it's all discretionary. And we have to decide, am I going to look? So let me give you an example. You're evaluating applicants for a position as a faculty member at Willamette. I don't want to see their photo. I don't want to know that kind of information. But I, I could Google them. <laughs> you know, and interesting things turn up. Sometimes people will write in their essay, I have my whole life wanted to be at a small liberal arts college like Willamette. And then you Google them and you find their homepage says, I have always wanted to be at a major university like the University of Oregon. Uh, it's hard not to Google them. Uh, I should say search. Google is just one search tool. Uh, it's hard not to search 
But then I start getting exposed to some other information, right? I find out what they look like. I find out some things about their age that might not be in their materials. Uh, I might find out other kinds of information about them that really aren't relevant to the job. I might find something about their political orientation. I might find something about the, the social causes they support. Should that influence my decision of whether somebody's a competent neuroscientist? So if I'm overly confident that I'm immune to bias or that I can correct if necessary, I say, search away. Right? There's no, no dilemma for me. I might not recommend it for you, <laughs> but for me, it was okay. So I believe we're at a time here to stop for a few questions. Um, we're gonna continue on uh, with a, a few uh, bits of research here because what I've just introduced is what is now sometimes referred to as the bias blind spot. This tendency to see others as vulnerable to a range of biases that we see ourselves either as immune to or at least less vulnerable to. Hello. Hi. Jeanette, thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you could say something, uh, and, and I hope this isn't uh, out of line, about the political divide we have now and the, and the biases, and like where each side thinks the other side is brainwashed. I mean, that's our bias. So, I mean, this is really, I think, an important thing. We need to find a way to to work on. No, I, 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 you've noticed I haven't emphasized political issues heavily here, uh, but it's certainly uh, probably one of the prototypical cases of this, and we talk about it a lot in my uh, seminar. Today we're talking about the political biases of social psychologists. About uh, over 90% of social psychologists identify as liberal, and there's questions about whether that systematically distorts the way they do their studies, uh, the kinds of questions they ask or pursue, uh, how how high a threshold they set for evidence. Do they set a lower threshold if the results seem to be in line with their political views, but set a higher threshold for evidence if the results seem to conflict with their political views? Uh, but we certainly do see these kinds of things in media consumption. And although I haven't done the survey, I, we have good evidence to believe from other research that most people believe they see the world accurately. <laughs> Something called, we'll talk about it briefly, it's called naive realism. There's sort of three steps. I see the world as it is. Other reasonable, rational people see the world as I do. I mean, I have good intentions. I'm not trying to be distorted. I am making a good faith effort to see the world as it is, and I think I do. And so other reasonable people would see the world as I do. And if they don't see the world as I do, then they're either uninformed, and I'll try and fix them. Uh, they are uh, ignorant, and maybe I can't solve that. Or they have bad intentions. They are maliciously believing in things that are not true. But it's all rooted in this notion that I think I see the world as it is, any rational person would. Uh, Lee Ross is uh, one of the people behind this theory and it certainly ties into this notion of how we treat other people's uh, biases. Oh, Hello, <clears throat> good morning, I'm, I'm Joel. And uh, I think many of us in this room have served on various committees, uh, scholarship committees, selecting uh, candidates, maybe even for employment positions. And what's always bothered me, and I don't know, and I've been kind of confronted about it, is the people that will come, who maybe have a horse of the race, who bring additional information uh, outside of the criteria. They know the family. They know the hardships or, or whatever, and they share this and really contaminate the process. Uh, does that happen a lot? or well, How do you react to that, to, to eliminate that bias? Because it definitely makes a difference. Well, the less structured the situation, the more likely that is to happen. So uh, there are 
what we call actuarial models of decision making. Uh, I mean, an extreme version is when I was applying to graduate school. Uh, University of Illinois is one of the places that I applied as an Illinois resident. Uh, this is sort of pre-internet, so I had to write for them to get an application. And instead of sending an application, they said, we get an awful lot of applicants. We have to say most of them. So here's a formula. Plug in your GRE scores, your grades, some, a few other variables of information, and we're going to get, we've validated this prediction equation about your likelihood of success. If you don't score above a certain threshold, it's really not worth you applying. You won't pass our first hurdle. Now, that was appalling to a lot of people because we need to take into account individual circumstances, but that's also the point at which sometimes this information becomes a problem. We're going to talk about some things after the break. It turns out that when it comes to past experience, we tend to see other people's past experience as a source of contamination and bias. We see our other past experience, our own past experience as an asset, right? So if I'm going to be on a jury uh, about a robbery and I've been robbed, if other people have been robbed, it's like, well, I don't know, that kind of might sort of might skew their view of things. They have some lingering hostilities. Are they really going to be fair to the defendant? For myself, the fact that I was robbed gives me insights into this process and what it's the experience of the victim is like. <laughs> so to your point, sometimes we want to bring in our experience because we believe our experience is relevant, even though sometimes we believe other people's experience might be more contaminating. But the less standardized the system, the more that can intrude. I'm one of those people, when I go to my cardiologist and he pulls out his phone and he plugs in seven variables and said, your risk of a coronary event in the next three years is X, as a stats person, I kind of like that, right? If he's just sort of subjectively pulling it together and he's not really paying attention to some of the information, but he's overly influenced by one other anecdotal factor that I happen to share, the research shows that that doesn't improve the accuracy of their decision making. There are even studies showing that if we use the formula and then we say, okay, well, let's let the professionals tweak the formula, their tweaks make it less accurate, not more accurate. But it's hard to get around that because we have such great faith in our intuitions and our belief that we are relatively immune to biases of overweighting information or being distracted by irrelevant information. Does the uh, scientific method meticulously practice offer a safeguard against contamination? Yes, the, the designs, uh, the principles of good experimental design are really about minimizing contamination so that the patient's expectations, so we talk about subject expectancy effects, we don't want the, the participant to know what we're expecting to find in a way that they either might want to be the good participant or they might want to uh, be the participant that makes the study work like it's supposed to. We try and insulate the researcher. The idea behind good design is that somebody who doesn't agree with your hypothesis, who expects a different outcome, could also administer the study and get the same results. Now that being said, the way you choose the question to begin with can still be influenced, right? So if I'm looking at conformity and one slant of that is conformity is bad, right? Other one says, well, conformity is what society is built on. It's a good thing. So the way you framed a conformity study might differ depending on whether you saw conformity as a bad thing or as a, or as a good rule following practice. Hi, my name is Joan. Hi. Um, several years ago, I, there was a, Closer. sorry, several years ago there was a test going around the internet, probably still is, I think was developed by Harvard or somebody like that on implicit racial bias mm -hmm. that I took. Um, and I ended up having some implicit racial bias, which was appalling to me. Um, and it turned out almost everybody does. And I can understand if you had a lot of bias, how you could at least start to deal with it and get rid of it. But I couldn't understand, I have a little bit of bias, what I can do about it once I'm aware of it. So uh, the, uh, the test you mentioned is called the implicit associations test. And we sort of have our explicit attitudes on issues like racial issues or weightism or some other kinds of issues. Um, 
But research has suggested that we might have these non-conscious beliefs that could motivate our behavior. This would sort of classically fit into the scenario of I might be influenced by something I don't want to be influenced by, but since I'm not aware of it and I don't know how strong it is and how much it's influencing me in any case, maybe I'm overcorrecting. Maybe I think I have an implicit bias against group X and I overcorrect in my judgment. This would be an argument for why we want to set up decision making patterns in ways that, that minimize the unnecessary exposure to certain kinds of information. Now, uh, just to reassure you, and, and this is a topic of some debate, but there's literally been hundreds of studies done on implicit bias, and they've been integrated, sort of averaged together in what they call meta-analyses. And it turns out that uh, the average size of the effect is relatively small. It doesn't, uh, it, these implicit biases don't seem to be very good or strong predictors of people's behavior, uh, generally not more predictive than just what we ex explicitly say. Some people have suggested that what is measured by implicit bias is simply your awareness of cultural stereotypes, not necessarily your endorsement of cultural stereotypes. If I'm a, aware of a stereotype about women being emotional and so I respond a few milliseconds faster when women and emotional get paired in this task, it doesn't mean I endorse it or believe it. It means I'm aware of the cultural stereotype that associates those. So that particular test isn't without controversy, but it is a good example of something where people say, how do I, how do I address this? Because I can't even sense how much is here. And I might overcorrect or undercorrect. Um, this is Sylvie. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is Don. Uh, I wanted to go back to political bias for just a minute. It seems to me a political scientist or someone who's politically motivated or uh, a history teacher, for example, might although they want to correct their own biases and be aware of biases and avoid biases, uh, might take a different approach to it in that uh, if I were uh, trying to sort out things, you know, do I believe in this, do I believe in that politically, uh, I would not want to, if I were of a li liberal persuasion, I would not want to restrict myself to MSNBC. I would want to, uh, you know, go to Fox News from time to time and try and draw on a wide variety of sources in order to uh, come to my own conclusions that are less biased. If I were a history teacher, I would want my students to be exposed to Howard Zinn, uh, as well as more traditional sources, so that they are exposed to the point of view of the victors in in history, as well as well as the victims or the the losers in history. So. Those in those two examples, we're looking, uh, you know, we're not cutting off. We're not saying I can't look at this, I can't look at that. We're saying go to a wide variety of sources, and that and that will help you correct your biases as a political scientist or a political motivated person or a history teacher. So, so we would like to think that people would do that. <laughs> That's a very reasonable approach. And what I'd suggest is fits exactly into what we're talking about as a binding rule. If I say, I am going to force myself, right? I am going to set some rules for myself in terms of my media consumption. Right? Uh, I am going to set some rules for myself in terms of my reading exposure. Right? I'll read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times or, uh, or uh, you know, some other kind of combination. We make explicit rules for ourselves to ensure that rather than simply saying, uh, I've already written off that perspective. I know they're wrong. There's nothing to see here. All I'm going to do is be contaminated by that, right? A lot of people say, if I expose myself to that other view, it's just going to mess with my mind. I don't want to hear that stuff. I need wax in my ears. Um, Kisti, can you make it real brief because it's break time? Sure. Uh, when I was in college, there was a, a lecturer that was coming by. He'd been gone to all the colleges and so forth. And he was a, uh, this man was a, the leader of the American Nazi Party. And there were schools that decided just not to have him come at all. And then Oregon State, it was my undergraduate, <laughs> chose to have him there because it was on the basis of uh, uh, free speech. He was there, and, but the crowd the, there was very biased in terms of what he was saying. And they were sort of out to, you could tell the, how they were persuaded to some extent about his argument. He managed to turn all that around 
and against them and really got people, he was so effective at propaganda that he made them start thinking differently and you could hear that some of the same people that hooted him and booed what he said were beginning to question their own beliefs and I'm just amazed on how easy it is for some people to effectively get other people to over adapt and to follow along you know with whatever the crowd's doing and could you speak about a little bit about uh, the context of reality you know, one of the things we, not only do we have quite high confidence in our level of judgments, we also have quite a bit of confidence in our own autonomy and ability not to be influenced by others. Uh, sometimes in social psychology we talk about normative or social influence versus informational influence. Right? And so somebody who never drank in high school gets to college and they start drinking and mom and dad say, you're conforming, and they say, no, nobody said if you don't drink you can't be my friend. I just realized that I had some messed up views that were leading me not to drink and now my eyes have been opened, right? And all of these other wonderful opportunities. So it's not that I've conformed, I've simply become more informed would be their judgment. And from the parents' point of view, they might say, there's some contamination going on here in terms of what you're exposed to. And this is part of the dilemma of things like speech codes at colleges. The one side saying we need all the information, that's part of a rational actor model. Other people saying some ideas are too dangerous to put out there, uh, they hurt others. If we hear them, they're like that toxic seed that can, can take root. It was Jefferson who said that, that you know, the, the best antidote to information we don't like is more information. I'm not quoting him exactly. But that's a, that's a belief. That it turns out that we are vulnerable to these influences you know if we hear something enough so deciding what is potential contamination that we want to avoid is is a dilemma well thanks jim for a fascinating hour uh try to be back promptly at 20 of the hour so we don't miss any more of this uh so uh we've sort of been working our way down this funnel to uh a topic that we're now uh, going to be calling the bias blind spot effect. Uh, and this is this notion that we're not necessarily introspectively aware of what's going on in our head, but we recognize that there are potentials for different kinds of biases, that getting paid by a pharmaceutical rep might shape your judgment, uh, that there might be a potential for gender or racial bias in hiring or economic bias in uh, college admissions or something like that. Um, so the idea behind the bias blind spot is it's not that we don't believe that bias is possible. We just tend to think that it occurs a lot in other people and <laughs> not so much in ourselves. So. So to preview where we're going, remember how we sort of built this logic that says we don't want mental contamination. By definition, we don't want our judgments to be contaminated. We wouldn't call it contamination if it was a welcomed influence. But it's very difficult to say yes to all of those questions and get to the point where we could actually bias. We're not cognitively prepared to do that. And so instead, these binding rules like exposure control, saying I won't let myself have access to this information, or the people who have access inf to the information, the people collecting the responses in a medical trial, won't be the people analyzing the data and making the decisions, right? So we try and separate those things out. But if that's discretionary, and I think other people are biased but I'm not, then will I bother to exercise discretion for myself, or will I simply think it's a good idea for other people? <laughs> so uh, uh, Emily Pronin uh, has been working on this for some time. She's one of the, the premier names in the field. It simply says, you know, we see others as vulnerable to many biases. We see ourselves as not or less vulnerable. There are a few people that think they're immune, but most people don't think they're immune. They say, yeah, it could be but not this time, right? I could be biased, but I wasn't in this case. Uh, 
uh, I could be biased, but wait, you're way off on the other side. I may be a little to the, this side of the political spectrum, but you're totally skewed over on the other side. So we already mentioned one example of this. Uh, the bias blind spot plays a role in why we see our own experience as an asset, but other people's experiences as a liability. Right? That if you share something in common with a student who's an applicant, instead of thinking of that, hmm, I don't have that bond with the other applicants, am I applying my standards equally? We're thinking, I can get more information, I can make a better decision because I have a similar life experience myself. You might be right. The problem is, is we don't know. As I mentioned before, a lot of the research shows that when we make statistical prediction models, they tend to do better than models that rely primarily on the uh, individual's subjective integration of information. We'd like to think that, oh, I can take into account all these interactions and I would wait this, but not if this is present. When you compare them head to head, the clinical judgments, as they say, and I don't just mean therapy, but clinical judgment as a subjective judgment like a person in the admissions office, uh, are consistently outperformed by statistical models. As a matter of fact, they're even outperformed by statistical models that mimic the clinician's judgment. That is, they'll make clinicians make a whole bunch of judges about who they think will be successful, intermediate, or not. And then they capture that into an equation so they can figure out what variables are waiting. And it turns out that if you just use the equation based on the clinical judgments, they do better than the individual clinicians because it imposes some consistency there, that the equation isn't distracted by these other potential contaminants. Another one I want to talk about, and it's going to tie into something took, uh, looked at here, is something called the self-serving bias. That is, we tend to see ourselves as better than average. Most people in surveys uh, think they're more honest than the average person. They think they are going to live longer than the average person for their demographics. Uh, they think they are better drivers than the average person, even with multiple accents. Uh, just a sidebar confession. Uh, I have been driving 45 years or so, and I have not had an at-fault accident. Uh, I've been hit by a couple of drivers, a hit-and-run driver and a person ticketed for reckless driving. I've never had an at-fault accident. My daughters hate driving with me. They say, you're so unsafe, I'm not going to do this. And this is the daughter, the older one, who, I, should, I was, didn't mean to identify which one. <laughs> one of my daughters <laughs> has already totaled two cars uh, at, at her tender age and still wants to lecture me. You know, you're just a bad driver, Dad. You know, let me drive. I'm thinking, statistically, this just isn't computing for me. <laughs> but we tend to see ourselves as be better than average. Now, as I will tell my daughter, some of us have to be. Right? <laughs> Mathematically. <laughs> she, she usually ends the conversation on that point. Uh, you know, some of us have to be, but we can't all be better than average. Right? So I'd like to pose the question. If the self-serving bias says we tend to think of ourselves as better than average on socially desirable qualities that don't have an objective measure. Like I don't think I'm a better than average pole vaulter or a better than average 100 meter dash person. There's pretty objective standards there. But on things that are more subjective standards, when I worked at uh, Mount St. Mary's College, was now Mount St. Mary's University, we did a faculty survey as part of their assessment. The results came in and 100% of the faculty said that they were better than the average teacher on campus. So no shortage of confidence among faculty. But if we tend to think we're better than average when we're really not, then do we think we're better than average at not mistakenly thinking we're better than average? Well, it's a bit of a tongue twister. But we don't see, you know, conceit as a socially desirable quality. We like to think of ourselves as modest. Oops. We like to see ourselves as, as modest and seeing ourselves accurately. But that means that we may not see ourselves as vulnerable to that bias. We may see ourselves as better than average at not falling prey to that bias. We see ourselves as better than average at not thinking we're better than average. 
So I've been collecting some data on this for a number of years. I first started this exercise in 96. I used it as a classroom demonstration a lot. It's been reprinted in, in some books. But I also used it as part of some research on the bias blind spot effect that we've done here. The data that I'll share here is based on uh, multiple semesters of uh, giving this exercise with my social psychology students. You guys completed one side of that. You read something about the college board inviting a million high school seniors to take the scholastic aptitude test. So this is one side of your form here. Uh, so you, you can, this print is a little small, but you have the, the form in front of you. So I'll read it. In one year for which I obtained data, 70% rated themselves as above average in leadership ability, 2% as below average. In ability to get along with others, 0% of the 829,000 students who responded rated themselves below average. 25% uh, saw themselves in the top 1%. And I've always felt that that's why in every sort of advising, consulting discussion we have with students that are having a roommate problem, it's the roommate <laughs> that, that has some kind of personal shortcoming that is uh, creating the conflict because we're all better than average at getting along with others. Um, so I asked people, the question. Half of you and half of the participants were asked, how often do you think you make this kind of self-serving bias mistake when judging or evaluating yourself? Will people be in complete denial, not me ever? Or will they say, mm, yeah, sometimes? The other half were asked, how often do you think the average person makes this kind of mistake when judging or evaluating themselves? Let's think about what we predict here. If we think that we're better than average and not mistakenly thinking we're better than average, we might acknowledge that we do this some, but other people even more. So I apologize for the quality of this figure I was working on, trying to make it a little prettier. But the question of am I conceited in my own humility Here are the data. So for the statisticians among you, these are called box and whiskers plots. So here's the other group. These are all the ratings for other people as based on a total of 132 aggregated across some classes. They could give an answer anywhere from one to nine. 50% gave an answer in this range. Almost all of the answers are between about a six and a nine for how often, in other words, yeah, I think other people do this a lot. This sounds pretty plausible to me. They read this information, they say, yeah, I can believe that. There were a couple of people down here, the outliers are marked that are kind of giving the benefit of the, the doubt. Here are the answers for the self. So it turns out you can't see the mark. This is the 50th percentile here. This mark right here. This is the 50th percentile in this graph. So this is at about a seven. So half of all our participants rated themselves down here. So one thing, you see a lot more variability, but you can definitely see that the distribution is much lower. Right? For those of you that are interested in questions of statistical significance, the probability of getting a difference this large by chance is less than two in 100. Uh, so we would reject an all hypothesis and say, something about the wording of that question matters. Now, in the experimental control, we try to keep everything the same. Everybody reads the same scenario, the same kind of question. It's just that subtle tweak in wording. Do you think others do this? Do you think yourself, you yourself do this? So this would be an example of the bias blind spot that we are indeed, to some degree, conceited in our own humility. So I've done a series of other studies on the question of exposure control. Remember, we're talking about Ulysses. It's like, do I risk exposing myself to the information? Uh, would I limit other people's access to information, but I want to hear it, and then is there any way to protect myself, right? So uh, Sarah Schroeder was a student. We worked on a couple of studies that we presented at uh, some conferences. And just briefly, we did these with introductory psychology participants. Uh, and this is the other task that you looked at. You got a sort of trimmed down version of the task. There was more detail on what people saw, but they were evaluating items for inclusion in an applicant folder for evaluating scholarships. What is the committee going to get to see? Our participants were or were not on the committee. So half of you were told, you're not going to be on the committee. You're just deciding what other people get to see. The other half of you were told, you're going to be on the committee. 
What do you want to see? The question is, do you give the committee different information when you're choosing for other people and have to make assumptions about whether or not they will use it wisely or be biased versus when you have to give it for yourself? And then the other thing we have them do is for each of those items, they didn't necessarily pick all of them, but that at the end of the study we said, we want you for each of these items to rate how much of a biasing effect you think it would have in actuality and how much ideally. Right? So that if there's a discrepancy, you say, ideally I think this would have no effect, but actually I think it will have an effect, you're expecting that that is a contaminating piece of information. In other words, you've made a judgment that says the actual influence of that factor is more than is ideal. So we're going to look at the information choices. Now, what are the bias items? You guys have the handout there. Technically, the only thing that is supposed to matter according to the rules and guidelines in this proposal is the quality of the essay. All the other stuff is not part of the judging criteria, not supposed to be part of the judging criteria. So the essay reprinted with standardized font and spacing, that's the requirement. We need that. We don't have messy handwriting. We have standardized font spacing. Um, and we have a paragraph uh, for explaining the judging criteria. You would want to know the judging criteria. Those are seen as appropriate items. By design, the others were all ones that we thought might have a potential influence, but they're not part of the judging criteria. So one of the most pronounced ones would be the applicant photo. That should have nothing to do with whether or not this person gets a scholarship, right? It is irrelevant information. The question is, out of these six other items, how many people just said, not going to look at any of those because they're potentially biasing? So if you look on the margin here, let's see, we got a, there we go. The percent selecting zero bias items. What percentage of the people only picked the two right ones and didn't pick any of the other ones because they might be potentially contaminating? Doesn't mean they're wrong answers, but they're all potentially contaminating bits of information. When people selected for themselves, only about 41% or so did so. In other words, about 60% took at least one or more of those potentially contaminating pieces of information. And by the way, they were potentially contaminating by their own standards because we, we collected ratings and these were pieces of data that they thought had the potential to have an unwanted influence. But 60% then took one or more, so only about 40% got none. When people were selecting for others, we got a different pattern. Now one of the differences here, it wasn't in your form, some people were just given the form sort of like you have, and the other half were said, hey, you know, we're a little worried about bias intruding on the judgment here, right? Making bias potential salient. We wanted to see if that would influence people. When they were warned about potential bias, it didn't change what they gave to themselves. They made no different decisions whether they thought bias was a potential concern or not. When selecting for others, if you said, oh, and be careful about bias, about 75% excluded things like the photo and the potentially biasing information from all the other committee members. In other words, it's not safe for them to be seeing this information because it's potentially biasing. Not so much for me. In one version of this, I can't remember what this one we're going to talk about too, there was one where we looked just specifically at the photo, because that's, that's sort of the prototype, right? The photo has no diagnostic information and contain a wealth of potential unwanted sources of influence on age, appearance, race, gender, things like that. And not one participant gave the photograph when they were in this condition, picking for others but about 40% of the group gave themselves the photograph. So it was clear that when judging for others, like photographs are a bad idea, but judging for themselves, eh, throw it in. Right? Why? Because I think I can control for bias, right? I think that somehow I will be immune to these effects, that I will recognize them and I'll be able to counteract them. But as we've talked about, the likelihood of that happening and meeting all those steps in that process are really low. So they are engaging in exposure control for others, particularly when they're concerned about bias, but not so much for themselves. <clears throat>
So I mentioned that they rated how much actual influence do you think the item will have and how much ideal influence. So when that number is positive, if you take their rating of influence on an actual score minus ideal, a positive number means you think it's going to have more influence than is ideal. When they rated for the impact of all the bias items, all six of them, how much they thought it would have on the unwanted influence they have on themselves, they're here. Other people, the actual influence is going to be a lot higher, especially if you've been led to think that bias might be a concern, right? I see on this rating scale the actual influence on average being almost uh, over two points higher on this rating scale than is ideal. Again, not so much for me. So we're sort of getting into this Ulysses effect, right? We're saying, do I let myself see this information? The trouble is, is these people aren't going to tie themselves to the mast, <laughs> right? They're, they're, they're putting wax in, in the crew's ear, but they're leaving the wax out of their own ears. And in real life, unless they've engaged in some other binding strategy, their only hope of remaining unbiased in the presence of this information is to be able to make them make their way through that chain of questions, which is actually a pretty low probability of success. So we repeated this study. We scored things a little differently this time, but we did this again with a, a fresh sample. And for this one, we simply counted, instead of whether they completely excluded bias items, here we simply counted how many of those other six potentially contaminating items like the photo did people pick. And in this case, for themselves, on average, about two and a half. For other people, we can't trust them. On average, less than one were we willing to give other people. We will give ourselves stuff that, again, we fully believe has the potential for contamination because we don't want to give them to others. In this particular study, the warning manipulation wasn't significant. In other words, basically everybody acted as though they were in the high warning condition uh, and, and uh, gave patterns similar to the first study for the warning condition. And then again, we did the actual ideal, how much actual influence, how much does that exceed the ideal influence for you? About this much, but boy, on those other people, not there. That's why I didn't give it to them. Right? I gave it to me because I didn't think it was going to be too big a deal, but I didn't want to give it to other people. So one of the things that I wanted to mention is that there's something unique about this design. Somebody could say, well, I didn't give it, oops, chained here. I didn't give it to other people because it was useless information. We, we kind of rarely have to make decisions about whether to expose ourselves to useless information. We have to make decisions about whether to expose ourselves to information that might have some diagnostic value. Now, this is a little tangential, but it's in another area of research that I do on uh, persuasive argumentation, the effect of weak arguments. Uh, you guys are all familiar with the Oregon Voters Pamphlet. You know, and you get in there, and there was an issue that I wanted to read more about. Uh, and so I, I read the first commentary that's listed that's in support of this uh, ballot measure. And it's obviously pro, and I'm reading this, and I was kind of leaning pro on this, and I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, this is the dumbest argument I've ever read. This is just ridiculous. How could somebody, and of course, as a cognitive psychologist, and my own research has shown what happens when people give you weak arguments, you don't just discard them, you counter-argue. You think of all the reasons why that argument is wrong. And then it dawned on me, somebody had paid, somebody who opposed the ballot measure had paid to put in a pro-argument that looked ridiculous so that people would see it, counter-argue it, and say, if this is what supporters of this think like, then I want no part of this, right? So very strategic here. Uh, so we have to make a lot of decisions. We're looking at information. We have to say, well, it might have some value, but it might ha have some contaminating information as well. So we wanted to do another study that looked to see if people would hold this sort of double standard in information where the information could have some value, but it could be potentially biased. You know, can I hold the wheat and get rid of the chaff, as they would say? Because it's pretty easy to withhold non-diagnostic 
as we say, are not valid information, useless information. The pic picture doesn't help us figure out who should get a scholarship or how good the essay is, therefore it's irrelevant or non-diagnostic. But contaminating information often has some mixed value. So we gave students a series of four problems. I'm just going to talk about two of them. This was pilot work, so two of them worked, so to speak. Two of them did not. But we had students rate the helpfulness of and their support for two alternatives in these problems. One which involved exposure control, limiting people's access to the information, versus an option that says, sure, go ahead and give people the information because it's got some value to it. So let me interpret this table. The first thing we gave them was a scenario about sequestering for a jury. Unfortunately, I've never been sequestered for a jury, but there are forms of sequestering where you're living in a hotel, you can't watch the news. This is a very powerful form of binding, right, that says we're not going to let the jury be exposed to information in the media or exposed to other people that they might talk to. So in certain kinds of cases where there's a very strong concern about this and the stakes are high, there can be a sequestering of the jury. This is very demanding, time consuming. It's very intrusive on people's lives. Um, I got to go home every night after, uh, you know, on a five day jury trial, but the idea of having to stay in a hotel and be isolated from media and other kinds of contact, that's a pretty severe binding standard. So we asked people, we described a scenario and asked them to say, how helpful do you think it would be to sequester? How helpful do you think it would be not to sequester, just to give instructions to try and avoid <coughs> outside influence? The difference in those is the number that we see here. So on our rating scale, they thought sequestering was better than the alternative, a positive number here. The scales are a little bit irrelevant. I think there were seven to nine point scales. For themselves, yeah, they saw the sequestering as more helpful than the alternative, but not as much, right? And it turns out this difference is statistically significant. Other people will benefit more from sequestering than I would. Now, when it came to whether they would support it, this difference wasn't significant, but it was in the direction of, yeah, I support sequestering more for others than for myself. This zero here basically means I didn't see sequestering as any better than the alternative. Now we gave them another one that uh, I've had some interesting conversations with my daughter. She's a Willamette alum, a biology major, an MAT grad, great driver. Um, <laughs> tell her I said that. Um, and, uh, and she's a seventh grade middle school teacher up in Beaverton. Um, and one of the things that's always an issue is that you have a new wave of students coming in. Do you want to know about their background or does every student get a fresh start? We as college professors have to think about that. Do I want to know the prior performance of my students or do I want to treat all my students as like, it's a clean slate, start over. It doesn't matter if you were a, you know, a C average, a B average, an A average. We all start with a clean slate in here because it's potentially contaminating, right? If I go in with low expectations for you, Maybe you have to miss a class and the first thing I assume is you're not invested in the class instead of saying, oh, I wonder if they were sick. I wonder what's going on in their lives, right? So there are some people who say, we want that background behavioral and standardized testing information in the schools because that helps us better tailor our teaching to our students and understand their circumstances and situations. But that's one of those mixed quality bits of information because it also contains information that could distort your judgment, right? set some pre-existing expectations that, that might unfairly influence your, your thinking. So we gave people that scenario. Now, in the self or other manipulation, half the people were told they're a school administrator and they have to make a decisions about whether or not teachers will be given access to this information, right? That's the others. And the other version of the scenario uh, they are asked to think about themselves. You're a teacher, right? Do you want to see this information? So you're an administrator deciding what others get to see or teacher deciding what you will get to see. And what we find is that in terms of comparing withholding tests to disclosing it all, that's more helpful for others than it is for me 
Others are in more need of that binding strategy than I am. And would you support that as a policy or intervention? People were substantially more likely to support that kind of restriction or binding on other people than on themselves. And again, so any of these pairs of blue boxes, these means are significantly different. These weren't significant, statistically significant, but they were in the expected direction. So again, we have evidence here of people saying, yeah, I get that binding stuff and that exposure control stuff, but consistent with the bias blind spot effect, I think it's more important for others than for me. So when we think in our daily lives and in our professional lives, just how often it's discretionary whether we bind ourselves by certain rules or limit our exposure to information. It's, very, it's a very big decision. I was once talking to, uh, one of the things that's been going on in higher education is a move away from required submission of test scores like the SAT and the ACT. And uh, this school had recently made a decision to go to what's called test optional. And institutions are free to use test scores in any way they want. They can weight it heavily, they can weight it not at all, they practice what is called holistic admissions. So schools are under no obligation to weight these test scores in any way. So if they happen to feel that they have a unique circumstance where the test score isn't reflective of the student's potential, they're not obligated to pay attention to that. So I asked the person, I said, well, why would you go, you know, test optional if, if you're free not to look at any test you don't want to look at or wait, not wait any test you don't want to look at? I said, well, he said, it's just, it's hard not to look, right? If you have it, it's just, hard not to pay attention and once I see it it's hard for it not to stick in my mind to which I said yeah we have a real like that it's called hide the chocolate so my, my wife is caretaker of the chocolate like if I see it it's just gone uh, so she hides it and and rations it out for she says it's for my well-being but I think she likes chocolate once in a while too and knows there won't be any left if I have access right now this is somebody who's saying I need to engage in some kind of exposure control because I'm afraid once I see the information, I'm not going to be able to ignore it in cases where I probably should ignore it. Now, separate issue, I had to point out, but you're letting the student make the decision of whether or not to ignore it. Right? My own suspicion is that rather than this benefiting, for example, maybe first generation students who have less familiarity with test taking, withholding test scores may benefit uh, more well-to-do students, uh, second, third generation students who are more savvy about their application process and thinking about, oh, strategically, this might be a good place not to send my SAT and just rely on my grades or something like that. So there's a little complication in that exposure control strategy because it's essentially the student who's deciding whether or not you would get to see that information rather than setting up a standard and saying we will or will not look or we will make a decision without consideration of these tests then we will look separately at the test to see if we should modify decisions in light of those. So quickly we're just going to get into a little bit of Pronin's theory on why does the bias blind spot occur? Why is it that we see others as vulnerable and us as wouldn't say not. In all these cases, people saw themselves as somewhat vulnerable, just, just not as bad as other people. Um, because a better understanding of the process might suggest effective approaches of debiasing. So when I ask people to speculate, one of the first things they mention is what we might call egoistic or self-enhancement motives. I want to feel good about myself. I like to think of myself as superior than others. It makes me happy. It enhances my sense of worth and well-being to think of my superiority. Uh, so maybe I won't think of myself as the world's best pole vaulter or a sprinter, but I have incredible ability to get along with others. And if you don't agree with that, you're just wrong. She mentions a second reason that we've already talked about. It was what we call naive realism. This is Lee Ross's work that says, we truly, in all sincerity, tend to believe we see the world as it is. Now, as a professional social psychologist, all my work is about the fact that we see everything through a set of filters and lenses. That is unavoidable. We can try and control for that, or we can try and acknowledge that, we can try and exploit that, but we see the world through lenses. But we tend to see, believe we see the world as it is. Other rational people will see it as we do. So 
I recognize other people's vulnerability to bias because I don't see the world through their eyes. I can imagine them seeing through filters. But I would know if I was seeing through a filter. And since I don't see myself seeing through filter, the light looks perfect through my eyes, uh, I just don't think I'm vulnerable to bias. Now the third and most important one that we've started doing more work on is what she calls the role of the introspection illusion. And she says, it's not so much egoistic desire for superiority, it's not so much that I just think I see the world as it is, people actually recognize the potential of bias. We've seen that in some of our data. It's just that people think that they would be aware of it. Say, that my, my colleague who doesn't believe in blind grading says, well, if, if I was being influenced by what I know about the student and their attendance and these other things and how I've graded this essay, I would notice it. I have access to my own thoughts. You don't, but I have access to what's going on in my head. I would know if it was having an impact on me. And if I don't sense it having an impact on me, then I judge myself not to be biased. So I might admit to, yeah, I could be biased in general, but in this case I wasn't. And I mean that in all sincerity because I didn't sense it, right? I didn't feel my brain turning around saying, oh, you know, I didn't like their attendance record. I'm going to move that grade a little bit down. Or, hmm, that person had a prior criminal record. I think I'm going to sort of uh, lean towards guilt because a little bit of his prior criminal record leaked out. But Pronin argues that this belief in our introspection is an illusion, that we really don't have that high level of conscious access. Yes, we're aware of a lot of our conscious thoughts and processes, but an awful lot of these things that contaminate our judgment are precisely those things that operate with very limited awareness. Now, I'm not talking sort of a Freudian unconscious, I hate my dad and I got mom issues, but this just outside of awareness. So if I'm only going to correct for my bias, if I happen to notice it intruding on my thoughts, but I'm mistaken about my access to those thoughts, what's going to happen? Now, one of the things that we thought is, well, people probably differ in that. By virtue of professional training, I'd like to think that I don't believe I have a whole lot of introspective access to my thoughts. If somebody says, I think this influenced your judgment, I might say, I hope not, but I might not be aware of it if it did. Right? I have to acknowledge that possibility. Other people believe, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of blindly going through the world. I know why I do the things I do. So we wanted to measure this as kind of a personality trait, like characteristics. So we called this belief in introspective capability. David Cantor, one of the authors here, had started developing the scale, and we uh, had developed a variety of work. But here are the kinds of questions that get asked on this measure. I won't give you the whole 15 items. The true inner workings of my mind are a mystery to me. If you agree with that, you score low on belief in your introspective capability. That would be reverse scored. Um, and, and they answer on, I believe, a seven point rating scale. Another question would be, uh, when I prefer one thing over another, I usually know the underlying reason why. Absolutely, right? Uh, except empirically we don't. Uh, lots of subtle things that show that uh, preferences and products are shaped by subtle features that people don't recognize. Another example, I believe my judgment can be influenced by factors outside of awareness. Definitely not. Okay. I am high in my belief in introspective capability. But on the other hand, if I say, yeah, the you know, workings of my mind are kind of a mystery to me. I don't always know why I prefer one thing to another, and I do believe I can be influenced by these outside factors beyond my awareness, I'm going to score low on this. Now the question is, according to Pronin's theory, we should be able to predict how people respond to exposure or, or uh, self-serving bias problems by knowing this. So what we did is we had measured this trait scale and then all of them completed that measure that you got about uh, how often do you think you fall prey to the self-serving bias and how often do you think other people do. But before we get to that, we needed to show that this correlated with other measures as it should. So there are measures that measure degree to which people are uncertain about causes. And we did find that people high in belief in their introspective capability tend to score low on causal uncertainty. They express very little uncertainty about causes. Since we believe this is an introspection illusion, we are also able to show that people who score high in belief in introspective capability also score high in a measure of self-deception, right? where they endorse beliefs that appear to be clearly uh, 
we won't call them delusional, but self-deceptive. And they tend to score high on measures of self-control. People who believe they have eye introspective capability also tend to believe that they are in control of their actions. We didn't want it to correlate with some other measures that might be potential confounds. So it doesn't correlate with your belief in your degree of free will, uh, your tendency to present yourself in a positive light. Right? In other words, people aren't just saying, I have belief in introspective capability because I want to make myself look good on surveys. Uh, and it's unrelated to whether people think of themselves as sort of analytical or intuitive thinkers, right? So we have some indication that the scale is sort of tapping into something like what we want. So we had a campus convenience sample that took the task that we talked about before. As we found before, people rated others' vulnerability as higher than their own. But those who are higher in their BIC scores, higher in the belief of introspective capabilities, rated themselves as less vulnerable. It's a correlation of about negative 0.3. In other words, the higher your belief in your introspective capability, the less you believed yourself as vulnerable. That applied only weakly to others. That is, if I'm high in introspective capability, it's not like I think others aren't vulnerable. A little bit, there's still a relationship there, but I'm more confident in my own judgment. So I want to mention one last study. I didn't put it here. It's kind of a complicated study with lots of dots. <laughs> I'll learn eventually. Uh, it's kind of a complicated study with lots of dots and points. But basically what we did is we tried a debiasing intervention. So the question is, can we debias this? Some people have said, well, what if we told them about research in the biased blind spot? And we showed how all kinds of people are vulnerable. Maybe that would change the way people responded. So we did a study in which as we had them make a, a product consumption task uh, that we slanted their judgment a certain way, we biased it on purpose. Then we gave them a fictitious study that said, your choice was, turns out, almost completely determined by this one subtle feature in the problem, this one product attribute. At least that's what the study said. Almost everybody shifted their answer as soon as that product attribute was changed. And then we asked them, so do you think you would have changed your mind? After reading about this research, do you think you would have changed your mind had that product attribute changed? People who are high in belief in their introspective capability for themselves said, no, <laughs> wouldn't have changed me at all. In other words, that debiasing didn't affect them. People who are low in introspective capability did so. In other words, they turned out rating themselves much like they rated other people. Whereas people who are high in belief and introspective capability, the biasing in intervention didn't work because I'm convinced I would notice it. So I'm still going to plow ahead. Yes, you can tell me about this vulnerability, but unless I sense it, I'm not going to respond to it. Now, I know that we're sort of at a wrap up time for questions here, but just to kind of bring this full circle, uh, we are looking at ways of trying to undo this bias blind spot effect because I think it's sort of a, a pernicious one, particularly with discretionary blinding. Um, perhaps we can improve people's knowledges of theories. Maybe I won't understand it introspectively, but if I have a good understanding of the things that influence people, then maybe I can build my protective structures in that way. Can we institute more blinding policies? What we do in the employment scenario, the kinds of things that we do, like if you're trying to remove bias from loan approval, are there ways of setting up mechanisms that check or reduce the exposure to information that might possibly lead to systematic discrimination in, say, loan approval? Uh, and then can we incentivize discretionary binding? So just to quickly give due credit here, I want to give a special thanks to Professor Sammy Basu. Uh, we worked on a project together. His half of the project was not on why people look at information they shouldn't. He was looking at why people don't look at information that they should. <laughs> so together we were working as a team on a grant. His help was there. Many undergraduates you've seen named in these posters and research projects. And this research was funded by the 
Templeton Foundation, or many of the studies were funded by the Templeton Foundation, a grant to Florida State University, and a philosophy and psychology joint venture called Philosophy and the Science of Self-Control. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Deanna. I was uh, up here. Oh, hi. I was a landlord um, for 40 years, and um, we were, you know, tried to be really careful about our tenants because it was our homes and we wanted them well taken care of. And we always did the income credit report, you know, no more than two people per bedroom, which is law. Were they smokers? Did they have pets? And then um, we had a huge variety of different gender preferences, races, religions, ages. So I always felt like I wasn't biased because we always had a lot, large variety of that. But at what point, because bottom line, it, my intuition was the final factor in whether they were able to be tenants or not, because I cared about the tenant landlord relationship. Is intuition ever considered a good criteria? Uh, it's very popular to psychology, uh, for psychologists to bash in intuition and show all the biases we have, but actually there's a lot of work showing that on average we tend to be pretty good, right? If we weren't, we would be stumbling through life, and yes, sometimes we feel like we stumble, but we would stumble worse if, if our intuitions and judgments weren't often correct. The problem is, is that we often don't get feedback that would tell us whether we're correct. So think of college admissions. Who do we get to see? The people we admit, most of whom succeed. Do we, do we know we made good decisions? Well, practically, yes, if they're succeeding. But what happened to the people that we didn't admit? If they're doing just as well, it may mean that the intuitions of the the admissions committee are, are adding no useful information. They might as well be admitting at random. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's true in our admissions or other university admissions. But we're often lacking that information because we, it's what we call the unseen control condition. We don't know what judgment we would have made had we not known that information. Sounds like you applied a kind of binding strategy saying these are the criteria that are going to enter in. But you're right. Uh, we trust our own intuition. But the intuition can be influenced by these subtle factors. And in, in society, sometimes certain groups uh, pay the price. So one of the reasons we try to keep records on housing ratios and employment ratios is not that we're committed to ratios, but that would alert us to the fact that something might be amiss. Um, this is Becky. I was thinking about being on um, hiring committees and the effort to structure the interview and have scores and be objective. And then what happens at the end of the day after everyone leaves the room when you're trying to guess the information that has for some reason not been made available to you? And then that question also is follow up thinking, how do you get people to buy into wanting to do this differently? Right. That is the... Um You know, can we debias that bias blind spot? That has been tricky. As I mentioned, the one study that we most recently uh, did on this said, well, we, we had a debiasing intervention, having, you know, it's a smaller treatment, but having people attend to talk like this. I'm hoping <laughs> that maybe people will buy into it a little bit more. But based on my research, those of you that are high in your belief in introspective capability are less likely to buy <laughs> to buy into it and go, yeah, 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 but not me. Those who are lower in your belief in introspective capability uh, might be more receptive to that particular form of debiasing. But again, this is trying to change things from the inside out. I sometimes think of what happened in the integration of schools, right? And people said, uh, is that Brown versus Board of Education? decision that was a, a, a landmark case. People said, you know, we can't do this until people's minds have changed. And the court said, no, we will do it and people's minds will change to meet that. So sometimes when we're in positions of responsibility and authority, there are things that we can encourage and impose as good practices, uh, make the best case we can for creating those mechanisms. But you're right, sometimes the decision isn't all ours. We have to talk other people into that decision. Uh, try as we might, we still are going to peek at those candidates on the web <laughs> to see what we find. And that's not irrational. Sometimes we find some interesting things by doing a, a search. <laughs>
Hi, this is Ken. Uh, I don't want to be biased. I have access to a source of information that I believe to be biased. I sometimes ignore this source of information. That's a bias. Sometimes I watch it so I know what those people are thinking, and then I spot the spin and uh, recognize their bias. And so therefore I'm biased because I'm either ignoring or Do you have any guidance for me on that? <laughs> Well, uh, there's always that gray area between personal views and my interpretation of the research. But uh, a, a number of years ago, I, I published an article with a former professor and dean of students. Some of you may know him, David Douglas, who was a, a dean of students here and professor in the rhetoric department. And we uh, published a paper on the persuasive ex uh, effects of teaching. We said that. Teaching is not just about giving information. It's ultimately about trying to persuade people. We try to persuade people with information, but it is ultimately a persuasive process. And there are certain ethical obligations that we have, which include getting competing views in both sides of the information. But one of the things as a psychologist that troubles me is I understand how very difficult it is for any one person to do that. Try as I might in a class to give an even-handed view of some political events. I just know more about the side I like than I know about the other. I give the best arguments for the side I like and turns out I give softball supporting arguments for the other side. And research shows that if you give strong arguments for your side and weak arguments for the other, so you're quote unquote being fair, people will counter argue those weak arguments. You'll be even more persuasive <laughs> than if you didn't give those weak arguments for the other side because people are going to knock those softballs out. So I'm actually a firm believer. Anybody in here attorneys? Okay, I, I, don't worry, I'm not going to make attorney jokes or anything. But you know, attorneys catch a lot of grief. But there's something to be said for the adversary system. And it's one of the challenges the university faces. To really help people learn, I believe we need passionate advocates of multiple diverse viewpoints. I just think cognitively, try as we might, it's very difficult for me to extract myself from my biases and be truly even-handed. So it troubles me greatly, regardless of my own political preferences, when 90 plus percent of my field identifies in a certain political direction, I see a shape, an impact that it has on work. And I think our students benefit for empirically justifiable reasons by being exposed to computing viewpoints and not just saying every professor should be able to fully embrace and defend both sides. And so in your own thinking, I, I, I think there's a similar thing. It's a high expectation of yourself. But it is important to have vigorous defense of the competing viewpoints. Um, I watch a source that often has the competing viewpoints on that channel. And they're beat up on for the, for, for the entire course of the program. Uh, I, I wouldn't exactly call them the best advocates for their position. Well, Jim, thanks for a fascinating and entertaining talk. And thank you. I, I want to.